Hey, this is Pastor Ty, and we want to thank you for joining us at Cowboy Junction today. Uh, when you hear this message, we want you to know that we've been praying, and praying that your faith will grow and be encouraged and challenged, and we really want you to know that we, we love that you're here. But what would help us is if you would subscribe, rate this, review this, and, and share it online. You can also help us by partnering with us. And a lot of people call Cowboy Junction home that attend on our online campus. But when you join us financially, you're really being a part of the team. You can easily give a one-time gift or set up a recurring gift at cowboyjunctionchurch.com backslash give, and uh, that'll help us so much. Uh, thanks again for being here, and I hope you enjoy this message. doing this morning? You good? You good? Awesome. My name is Chris, and um, it, it is my plan and my desire that we have some fun this morning. Can we do that? We, awesome, eight of you. Cool. Um, all right, well, we'll have a great time. The rest of you can just listen in. Uh, my name is Chris. I'm on staff here. Um, I help manage a lot of the, the media, the graphic design, video, all our website, all that stuff. Um, and so, I, I get the opportunity in to speak on our week three installment of the Yeah But Why series. And a lot of this series, just give you a look in on our staff meetings and things like that, uh, a lot of these series come out of things that we've gone through and things, questions that we've asked. And so this whole series is talking about, basically, uh, they say that it's like a millennial thing, but I think it's a universal thing that we ask why a lot. Does anybody else do that? Like, we ask why. Like, whenever someone says, hey, we're going to do it this way, you go, yeah, but why? Or, like, for instance, for me, as a kid, I was raised in church, and my parents would say, all right, get up, get dressed, we're going to go to church. Yeah, but why? Like, we went yesterday. Why, why are we going again today? And so we had a lot of questions. And so we wanted to let you know two things. First of all, it's okay to have questions. And second of all, if you don't have questions, you should start asking some of them. Because these questions, Pastor Ty taught the first week, it's okay to ask because you're asking with the, the right heart. If you will ask God inquisitively instead of questionably, what, what that is is are you asking God to, to show you something or are you asking God, accusing him of not doing something? Does that make sense? And so this whole series is talking about it's okay to ask questions. I was raised thinking, and nobody told me this. It was just what I thought, and maybe you're the same. I was, I, I was raised thinking I can't ask questions because that means I'm doubting God, right? Like I can't ask questions because then that means I'm doubting him and it's not okay. You don't doubt God. And so doubt was the opposite of faith, which is we're told to have faith and fight the good fight of faith. But the opposite of faith is not doubt. In fact, doubt is the environment for faith. So a lot of times your doubt can lead you on this journey to figuring out the answers, or instead of figuring out the answers, draw you closer to the heart of God, to where you can answer some of those things with him. Maybe the question doesn't get answered, but a lot of times the satisfaction of knowing that you know your God better than you did when you started that question asking is what you needed. And so God's inviting us. That last song that we sang, he's bigger than I thought he was. It's asking us, will you trust him? He's got big, he's, he's big. You've got big questions, but he's still bigger. 
right? He's still bigger than your questions. He's still bigger than your doubts. He's still bigger than your fears, your past, your mistakes, all of that. And so if you will trust God with some of these questions, he's saying, will you please just trust me like a father, like I do with my, my kids. I'll bring them close and I get down into a kneeling position and say, come here, we need to talk. Not because you're in trouble, but because I want to teach you something. You have my full attention and I want you to know the truth about who I say that you are, about who I am, all of those things. And so we're going to go into some of those things. Jesus tells us in Matthew to ask and keep asking, to seek and keep seeking, to knock and keep knocking because he wants to answer all of those things for us. And so it's okay. This week we're talking about the church. What is the church? It's not just a building. It's a body of believers gathered together. It's it's a community. It's a family. We're going to dive into that. But first I wanted to answer some of the questions that you had texted in, some of the questions that... uh, We actually asked three different university college classes what were their questions that they had. What are their yeah, but whys? And so we're going to dive into just a few of those. I'm going to rapid fire, try and get them done really quick. So if you're taking notes, take notes. If you're not taking notes, draw smiley faces or or things like that because I want you to pretend like you're taking notes. Um, Because if you're asking questions, I want you to I want you to be engaged. That these are questions that you may have asked. Um, And so write down what God is speaking to you, whether it's a scripture that we bring up, whether it's a point that you feel like sticks out to you, write it down so that you don't forget, so that you can remember these things and go back to them. So as we go into these questions, um, I want you to know that our desire is for you to understand that it's okay to ask questions, but to go on this process of, instead of just asking somebody else your questions, ask God your questions because he's the father that wants to draw you close and wants to explain things to you and teach things to you. So as we do that, I want to start by answering a few questions, but first, let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. All this is for you. God, we give you this message. We give you uh, our questions, uh, our doubts, our fears, all of it, God. We give it to you, lay it before you, and God, we just, we want to know you. We want to know your heart. We want to know your character. And Lord, we just, we love you. And we're honored to be here. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Steve mentioned it earlier, talking about our first, whenever we have a question, your first thing is you always Google it, right? Like you always Google your, your question. And so I actually did a little bit of research to find out how often we as humans Google. And um, in the year 2000, there were 14 billion Googles that's a lot. Like, that's a lot of questions that people have. In 2000, there are 14 billion Googles. In 2012, they stopped tracking it because they didn't want to keep track of it anymore because the number was too high. It went from 14 billion in a year to 3.2 billion per day. So in other words, in a week, we surpassed, in 2012, we surpassed all of the questions that we had in 2000. And that just shows you that our culture is saying, we're hungry for knowledge. We want to know, we want to understand. And so teach us something. And so as we dive into scripture, I want you to know that it's okay to ask these questions. A lot of the things that that we're talking about this morning, I Googled. Now just be warned, there is stuff online that is not okay. And we're going to cover that in a little bit. There's stuff that you can find an answer for anything. Like you want You want that question to be this answer? You could literally type it in and get that exact answer and be like, see, somebody with a PhD agrees with me. They don't actually have to have a PhD. They could just put it online and everybody's like, yeah, cool. They know what they're talking about, but they don't. So what we do is in in searching these questions, first, we make sure that it lines up with scripture. That's the first thing that we do. So if you have a question, make sure, does that really line up with Scripture? Not just a verse of Scripture, but the context of the story. The story as a whole, does it line up with that? Is it teaching the truth as a whole? If you, if you want to get real scholarly, what I'm teaching you right now is there's two different types of Bible study. There's exegetical and there's eisegetical. In other words, the exegesis, the exegetical way of looking at scripture is say, let's look at the whole context and we're going to figure out what the truth is in that scripture. And then that is the truth that we stand on. Eisegetical is I have this idea and I'm going to insert my idea, incept it into the scripture so that it says what I want it to say. That's some of the things that you find on Google. And so um, in that, 
we want you to know that first, your questions will, be, will line up with Scripture. And then second of all, there are some gray areas that the, it's not black and white of what the answer is. Like we've gotten questions and people are wanting a yes or no answer, a black or white, a this or that. And a lot of times in Scripture, you go, it's not, it's not that clean cut. In some areas it is, but some of them are just not super clean cut, which means you go back to the scripture as a whole. What does the character of God say? If you have read your scripture and say, I can't figure out this exact answer, then you need to look at it as a whole and go, okay, but the character of Jesus lines up with this. So, okay, if this answer lines up with that, then okay, then we're headed in the right direction. And then the third one, is ask somebody who's been on this journey of walking with Jesus a little bit longer than you have. Somebody who's done a little bit more life, has a little bit more experience, um, because they're going to be able to help you and go, actually, let's look at this, because I remember this story in Scripture, and Jesus did this, or this is what happened in the Old Testament, and, and it helps you answer some of those questions. And so as we go through this, I want you to, to write down the questions, write down the answers, the Scriptures that we bring up, um, because all of it is based out of what we read and what we find in the Bible. First question is, what's the deal with all of these different Christian denominations in different religions? What's, I love the way that's phrased. What's the deal? What's the deal with this, you know? And I, I look at it and go, this person is like, I, I, I tried to like find out who they are by when I read it, like figure out what their question really is. It's probably somebody who is new to this church thing and they go, why are there so many options? Like, how come there can't just be like one or two? Like, I love a Pollo Chihuahua because it has like one thing on the menu and they do really well at it. Like, you want a quarter chicken, half chicken, or a full chicken? Like, that's what you got. And so this person's going, how come there can't just be a one and there's so many different options? I actually did the research and found out that there are over 33,000 Christian denominations. Christian denominations. That's not talking about any other religions. That's just in the Christianity world. There's over 33,000 denominations. And the way that we got there is because a lot of times people would like disagree on certain issues. So there'd be like a small dispute of like, I think this scripture means this. And somebody else goes, no, it doesn't. It means this. And so their church would split and they would begin to, to go their separate ways. And all the people who agreed with this person was like, we're starting our own denomination. And this person's like, well, fine, we are too then. And so then now there's two and then it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And so there's over 33,000 denominations in Christianity. But I want you to know this. In 1 Corinthians 1, uh, verse 10, it says this in the message translation. I have a serious concern to bring up with you, my friends, using the authority of Jesus, our master. In other words, he's going, Jesus has asked, like, I, I'm coming to you, pleading with you. I'll put it as urgently as I can. You must get along with each other. You must learn to be considerate of one another, cultivating a life in common. So all that to say, unity is the goal. The goal was not to have 33,000 different denominations of, of belief systems. The goal was one, unity. Because in this scripture, it goes on and says, there's people that are saying, I follow Jesus. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. And in this scripture, he's going, no, no, no. The goal is not who you follow as a person. The goal is Jesus. And if our focus is Jesus, then let's lay aside all of the weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Notice it says weight and sin. There's other things that aren't a big deal that we need to lay aside and run the race with perseverance marked out before us, the, the race of faith. And as we push towards that, we can come unified with one goal, and that's to see the name of Jesus preached to as many people, to draw the hurting. And so as we do that, we will understand that there are going to be incorrect teachings that happen. Just like what we were talking about with Google, there's going to be things on there that's garbage and you don't need to, like you just, they don't even deserve your time. And some of the things that I read, I was like, this person just needs a counselor to talk to <laughs> because they got some stuff to work out. Like you can read that in their, in their words. And so in 2 Timothy 4, it says there's going to be a time that people don't listen to sound teaching, but they seek ear tickling messages. They seek what they want to hear. They want to hear certain things. And so they're going to 
they're gonna figure out who's saying it. And then they're gonna lift him up on a pedestal and go, let's follow this guy because he said what I wanted him to say and it doesn't necessarily have to be backed by scripture. And so that's where different religions, different denominations come from. The next question is, if God has the power, why doesn't he finish world hunger, violence, and cruelty? This is another one that I would say, are you asking inquisitively or are you asking questionably? Because if you're not careful, you can ask this question accusatory at God. Why don't you finish world hunger? Why don't you do this? And then James 2, verse 14 through 16, it says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? This question a lot of times takes our attention off of God and puts it on our surroundings and goes, how come this, how come the world's like this? And I would say this, first of all, the world's broken. The whole system was broken from Adam and Eve in the garden. The system was broken. And now we are living in a broken world that is hurting, which is why we need Jesus. And so as the broken world is hemorrhaging in pain, we find out that Jesus goes, if you'll just come to me, I want to help you fix those problems. So the person asking this is going, how come God doesn't fix it? And God goes, how come you don't fix it? Because I'm giving you the desire to do so. I've commanded you to do it. You just got to step out and do it. So if you see a problem, fix a problem. That's, that's part of what we do as a Christian community, as a body of believers, is we find needs and fill them. Next question is this, why do we go to church? Why do we have to go to church? Uh, I grew up asking this. I, I was like raised in church, and I'll tell you a little bit about that here in a minute. Um, but the first thing I want to say is we were instructed to come together. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says, let us not consider, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as, that in, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So in other words, we're called to come together to build each other up, to encourage each other. Um, and then it actually, if you were to look at New Testament and then go back in time and look at the Old Testament and the, the history of the Sabbath day, which is the one day that we set aside and say, we're going to focus on, on God. And so that's where... Sunday church came from. That's where the one day a week gather came from this. Jesus actually did this. Jesus would come once, once a week. Now, if anybody didn't know to, need to go to church, it was Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, he's got it all figured out. In fact, some of the things that they were teaching, he probably was like, eh, let me help you figure out what that really meant. Um, like he's super gangster and he like steps up. It says this in, in Luke 4, 16. As he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Now, what goes on to happen is he actually stands up. And in the Old Testament, Old Testament is everything that happens before Jesus. And New Testament is Jesus and then everything after. And so Old Testament, there's a book called Isaiah or Isaiah, if you're like one of the real, sound real smart. <laughs> like, but he, he stands up, Jesus in the synagogue, walks over, opens up the scroll, reads out of Isaiah, which is prophesying the coming of the Messiah. So like, super baller move. Jesus stands up and goes, let me read you something. Blah, 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 and is reading his soon-to-come biography. And everybody's like, huh. And he sits down and he goes, you have no idea what just <laughs> happened. Like, that, that's like the ESPN, da na 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 Like, that was the highlight. And they just didn't understand that he was speaking about himself. But if Jesus did it, if Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, then I, I, it's good enough for me. Like that's a good reason for me to go, okay, if he did it, it's, I'm gonna do it. And so I wanted to, as we wrap up that question, I wanted to ask another question. How many of you grew up in church? Raise your hand proud. Some of y'all like, you were taught in church to raise your hand high. You know what I mean? Yeah, I was raised in church too. In fact, as, as that was one of the reasons that Pastor Ty asked me to talk about this. He was like, Chris, you, you were raised in church. Can you talk about what the church has been to you and what is the purpose of the church? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. So I started doing a little research to figure out how long I've been going to church. And I was talking to my mom and I asked the question of this, when was it that I finally like went to church? 
like a lot of people will wait till they get to a certain age before they take their baby. Uh, I was eight days old. Like, and my mom was like, we're going to church. <laughs> and, uh, and I was born uh, into a pastor's family. So my parents have been pastors my entire life. Uh, the insider language is I was a PK, which is a pastor's kid, um, which also means that I've got a past. Um, some of the worst people that you know were probably pastor's kids, and you just didn't know it. I didn't really have a rough past. I was born and raised in church, and, and so I started doing the math of how many services I've, I've sat in, so much like this, or maybe a Sunday school service. That Sunday school was basically like childcare for the kids so that they could, the adults could have adult time before they have to go sit in service. And so I was in all of these different services. So I started doing the math and I found out that over my 30 years of life, I've sat in over 8,000 services. That's a lot. And so I'm texting my mom and I'm like, that's crazy, isn't it? And she goes, yeah, what's funny is we should probably be better Christians. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> You'd think I'd have 8,000 sermons worth of wisdom, uh, but for some reason I just didn't pay attention, I guess, or, or it didn't sink in. Um, that's why taking notes is so important, because um, I would have 8,000 pages worth of notes. Man, that'd be awesome. But 8,000 services. So I've sat in a lot of these settings. I've heard a lot of sermons like the one that you're hearing now, and so I want to encourage you that church is not about just this. It's not just a moment for you to come and sit down and hear what somebody has to say and then go, cool, man, see you next week. Or uh, I think it's good so that we can check it off our list. We say that we went to church. Uh, that's not what church is about. Um, I want to get this out of the way and say that what is the church? It's a loaded question. It is a loaded question. It is, it's so packed. Like, this is a, a message that you have to like, there's several layers and there's several different directions that you could talk about the purpose of the church. Um, the metaphors and the depictions um, from Jesus and other writers in the New Testament, the church is a family, it's the bride of Christ, it's a vine, it's a temple, it's the body of Christ, it's a flock, it's an army, the, the list goes on. And for those of you that grew up in church, you would say something like, I'm in the Lord's army. <laughs> yes, sir. Like that was like one of the songs that we sang. Another, another thing, I want to play this, this song real quick. I'm just going to play the first few seconds and I want to see if you recognize it. Have you heard this song? Okay, no applause. Does anybody know that song? It's Louie Louie by the Kingsmen. Um, I grew up in Sunday school knowing that as Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Oh, ba somebody goes, oh, yeah. Oh, baby, let my people go. Ugh. So it wasn't until I was like 15 that I heard that song, and I was like, oh, they redid Pharaoh Pharaoh. <laughs> Only to find out that the song was written in 1955, and my teacher just taught me something different. And so... Church is so much a part of who I am that I wanted to talk about this because a lot of times I was under the impression and under the assumption that church is a place that you go. It's a place that you attend, right? Like it's a place that we're all going to go, get in the car, get dressed, get your Sunday best on because we're going to church. But church is not a destination. Church is a community of people. I wanted to say this, you're not called to be a church attender. You're called to be a follower of Jesus. You are called to be a follower of Jesus. It's not about how many times you go or how many times you miss. It's about, are you following Jesus? And part of that, it would be, do you acknowledge the Sabbath? Are you following Jesus in that habit and coming to the community, coming to the reading of scripture and to worship and corporate worship and coming together? And so, Real quick, I wanted to say, if we're called to be followers of Jesus, then let's look at what he said about the church. Let's look at how he lived his life and kind of dissect it that way. The first mention of ecclesia, which is church, the first time it was mentioned was Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. Um, Jesus is asking all of his disciples, the 12 guys that he's doing life with, he said, who do people say that I am? Like, who do people say that I am? And so they said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, um, others say you're a great prophet, and he goes, okay, but who do you say that I am? 
Like you're the 12 that's gotten an inside curtain, behind the curtain look. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, it says this. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What's, what's funny is a lot of theologians will say that he was saying that on Peter he was going to build his church, but he actually, he's just, Jesus was a witty guy. And he's using a, like a pun because the word for Peter was Petros, and the word for rock was Petra. And so what he was saying was, on this rock, the rock of the truth that you just said, that I am the son of God, the Messiah who's sent to save humanity and draw them back to himself. That's what I'm going to build my church on. So real quick, what is the church? If it's not based on that statement, it's not church. Church is all about the rock being Jesus. Jesus is the foundation. He's the cornerstone. And all of these um, metaphors that, that we mentioned earlier and all of those things, it ties back to Jesus. And so if it's not about Jesus, then it's not church. So Jesus was asked a lot of times who he would spend his time around. Because if community, if church is a community and coming together, then we need to look at who Jesus did community with. Okay, so he, he actually mentions who he hangs out with. And a lot of times it was people that the religious people church people did not like. And so he's asked in Luke chapter five, it says, and the Pharisees and the scribe grumbled at Jesus's disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So this scripture explains who Jesus is all about. This would be, he's, he's basically given the illustration of, if you were going to go to the doctor, and you just go to the doctor, and you're like, hey, I'm, I know I'm in the emergency room, but I just wanted to let you know, I had a sore throat. And the doctor's like, okay. And you're like, that's it. I just need to tell you, I had a sore throat, and I am better. <laughs> and the doctor's like, okay. Um... There's a lot of people out there that really need me and need my attention and need my care. And so I think it's great that you had a sore throat, but there are people who need me. And Jesus is saying that same thing. I didn't come for the people who think they have it all together, which we're going to talk about in a minute. I came for the people who admit I'm hurting. I need something. I need you to help me because there's this pain that I can't figure out where the source is coming from. I can't figure out what exactly is happening. And so I need you to help me. And Jesus is going, those are the people that I came for. He's asked again about his, his crew that he hangs out with, and he answers with three different stories, three different parables. The first one he talks about is a shepherd. And this is a shepherd who leaves 99 sheep to search for the one lost shepherd. We have a song that we sing about it, and it's talking about he leaves the 99 to find the one. And so in this, Jesus actually asked this. It says, um, I'm just going to read the, the part. So he told them, verse three, a parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. When he has come home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who have no need for repentance. And so Jesus, in this question, they asked, why does he hang out with people who are known to be sinners? Why is he hanging out with people that my mom told me don't hang out with? And Jesus says, let me tell you a story. What man of you wouldn't leave 99 to find one lost sheep? I love this this question because... um, it's like the rhetorical question that your teacher asks or that your, like your parents would ask you, like, <laughs> who decided it was a good idea to put the toaster in the, to put the toast in the toaster three times in a row? And you're like, me? Mm-mm. No, do I? No. Yes. Uh, 
I have a five-year-old daughter who now blames her one-year-old brother that he does things. Like, she's just now realizing, like, I don't have to take the blame for all this. <laughs> and so in this, in this, Jesus goes, what man of you wouldn't leave 99 to search for the one? And I would be the one that's like, uh, I probably wouldn't, like, because there's 99. Like, that's a lot. But then there's one. Like, if you gave me $100 and you're like, hey, can I have $1 back? I'd be like, yeah, sure. Like, I, I'm not missing the $1. You, you, I have 99 still. And so in this story, Jesus goes, what man of you? In other words, who is so loving and so gracious and so kind that would leave 99 for one? And I imagine all of them were like, only an idiot. <laughs> and Jesus asked this question because he knows the character of the shepherd because it's him. Who would leave a perfectly good flock to go find one dumb sheep? I read, a, I read a commentary that somebody said, it wasn't even like a dog or like cattle that they're smart enough to come back. It was a sheep. <laughs> and so Jesus is very intentional saying like, they're, they're not smart. But the cool thing is, is that when sheep gather together, they're safe. Because it's when the sheep are by themselves that the predator will pick them off one by one. And so Pastor Ty actually brought this up as we were talking about this message. He said, there's been some people, and this is going to be a shock to some of you, and this is probably going to cause controversy. There's been some people that we've asked not to come back to our church because they got in the flock disguised as a sheep and started picking them off one by one. And what we've found is that as a flock, we come together and go, no, 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 no. That, this is a flock that we're going to take care of, and we're going to watch each other's backs, and we can't have that. And we've had the discussions of, hey, if you're going to be here, you're going to have to, we've seen this in your life, and we've spoken the truth in love, much like Jesus has commanded us. We've, we've tried to help them see truth but they just want to pick off sheep one by one. And so we say, you know what? That's not, that's not what this body's all about. That's actually called a parasite and parasites eat the body. And we're not gonna allow a parasite to eat our body. So you're gonna have to leave. And that's not saying that you can't come back. That's just saying until we figure out that and you can work on you first, we're gonna ask that you stay here until you come back to the flock. That was just totally like side note. But this whole sheep flock is all about watching each other's backs. And if they are staying together, then they're going to be safe. Because I look at it, and I've always, remember, eight days old, I was in the church. So I've been in the flock for a long time. And so I look at it and go, well, Jesus, how come you're leaving me to go find somebody else? Because I get kind of selfish. Does anybody else get me focused? Instead of being Jesus focused, it's Mises focused. And I'm just focused on me. And so I look at it and go, how come you're leaving? And he goes, you're in community. If you'll stay together, you're going to be okay. The next parable that Jesus tells is a parable of a woman who lost a coin, and she, she has nine coins, but is trying to find one. And the thing that there's a, a correlation with the first story is that once she finds the coin, she calls to her friends and her neighbors and says, come rejoice with me, for I lost it but now it's found. And so there's this common theme that you begin to see that's interwoven in here. And then the third parable is the one that I really want us to focus on. And it's the par parable of the prodigal son. And I taught this, I think it was one of the last times that I spoke, but there's a story that there is a prodigal son. There's two sons. They go, the younger one goes and asks his father, I want my inheritance. In other words, I wish that you were dead. Give me what's coming to me. And so the father divides it and gives it to his two sons. And the young son goes to a distant country, spends it on frivolous, wild living. He basically wastes all the money. When the money runs out, he realizes he doesn't have anything. And then there's a severe famine that hits in the world. And he decides, okay, I've got to figure out how to survive. So he hires himself out. And I want you to understand this. When he says that he hires himself out to this foreign country uh, citizen, he wasn't just saying, I'll work for you. When you hire yourself out, he was becoming his servant. And he said, I'll take on your name. I'll become your worker. Like you can, 
you, uh, you take me and treat me however you want. I don't deserve anything. And in fact, I'll go feed your pigs. And so this guy from this foreign country employs him and says, okay, you'll be my servant. I want you to feed the pigs, which is a Jewish person, side note. Pigs were, you don't touch them. You don't go around them. Like that was a big no-no. And he says, if you will go serve, like feed the pigs. It says that he begot, began to get so hungry that he desired to eat the pods that he was feeding the pigs. And then he has an aha moment, this revelatory moment and goes, you know what? What if I go back home? Because my father treats his servants better than this. I'll go home and I'll say to my father, father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. If you will just hire me as one of your servants, let me serve you and live in your house. And so he gets like all pumped up. Have you ever had to like apologize to somebody and you practice it over and over and over? So then he begins to wander back into his, his homeland. And as he gets there, it says that his father saw him a long way off. In other words, his father was watching and he was waiting. And his father ran to him, threw his arms around him. It says that he fell on him and that he kissed him. And then the son begins his speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And before he can say anything else, before he can get his entire speech out of the way, the father stops him and doesn't even, this is, there's so much to this. He doesn't address what he said. He doesn't address the false, the lie that he had believed. He address, he ignores him. He, he ignores him and hire, like calls out to his servants and goes, I want you to get me the robe. I want you to get me the ring. I want you to get, you, get sandals and put them on him. And I want you to get the fattened calf and we're gonna, we're gonna party like it's 1999. <laughs> and I want us to celebrate because my son was once lost. He was dead and now he's found, now he's alive. And so the son doesn't even get to explain this. And so there's two things that I wanna highlight in this that both of the sons have an issue because while all this is happening, they go back to the house. They begin to have this party. Like the other two stories have said, they call the neighbors, call everybody. They have this party. And it says the older son was still out in the field. It says, it says this. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came, he drew near to the house and heard music and dancing. His older son was continuing to do what he thought he was supposed to do. He thought, I'm supposed to work. That's what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to work. And so his father runs, gets his younger brother, and he just continues to work in the field. And I've been guilty of this. There have been too many times that somebody has come home, that Jesus has brought them back into community, and I have been so busy with what I'm doing that I forget to acknowledge and celebrate the fact that somebody came home. And the, the son, the, this is another thing that I read in there. It said that he was out in the field. He didn't even notice that all the servants left. He was so me focused that he was just in, his, in the zone. And the other thing that I read in this is that he had given up on his brother. His, his father was still looking. He had given up. I'm just gonna keep working in the field. I'm gonna do what I'm supposed to do. He can live his life, live your truth. I'm gonna live mine. And we're just gonna go our separate ways. And he began to be so me focused that he also had the same problem as his younger brother. They both lost their identity. They lost the identity of who they are, who they belong to. They're both sons. They both have an equal inheritance from their father. Just like the parable of the coins, the coin never lost its value because it was lost. It just wasn't found. It just wasn't back in the care of who it was supposed to belong to. And so the people that are outside of the church body, the people that are outside at, at Walmart, the people that are down the street from you that you work next to, they have the same value that you do. They just haven't been found yet. And sometimes, I'm just gonna be vulnerable. Sometimes I feel the responsibility to be the shepherd and to go find the sheep, right? Like I feel like I'm the one that has to go and get them and bring them back and I have to convince them that Jesus loves them. 
But Jesus says in, in scripture that no man comes to the Father except through me. I draw them. My Holy Spirit will draw them to repentance through love and grace. All our job is to do, this is something that I didn't speak in last, the last sermon. S something that our job is to do is not be the good Samaritan, because that's Jesus. Our job is to be the innkeeper. He brings the, the hurting, half dead, broken man to the innkeeper and says, I want you to take care of him. So you wanna know what the church is supposed to be? It's supposed to be an innkeeper that takes care of people that Jesus brings. The flock that gathers together and says, as he brings them in, we're gonna keep adding to our number and we're gonna keep reaching people, but we're gonna take care of each other. We're gonna watch each other's backs. So many times I've put the pressure of being the good Samaritan on myself. And Jesus goes, that's not, that's not your job, man. Your job is just to take care of the people that I bring you. So what is the church? We're just, we're just a hospital. We're an inn that take care of hurting and broken people. Because all of us have been there. All of us have been in that moment. And the minute that I forget that I was hurting and broken, I lose complete compassion for those people. Have you ever been there? You find yourself that you forget what your past was like. You forget the hurting and the shame and the guilt that you felt. And so you have no mercy and no grace for those people because they did this to themselves. You wanna know what the innkeeper didn't do? He didn't ask the good Samaritan, did he do this to himself? If he did this to himself, I can't take care of him. No. The good Samaritan brings him in, the innkeeper goes, yeah, I'll take care of him. Until you get back, I'm gonna take care of him. Just like Jesus said, I'm here, I'm bringing you to myself and I'm coming back, but will you take care of the body until I get back? Will you take care of the group of people that are following until I get back? And then he's gonna call us to our home, our eternal home. But until then, we're gonna live heaven on earth in community. It's not about a building. It's about us living the purpose that God's given us and taking care of hurting and broken people. And not forget what it was like to be the hurting and broken. I wanna pray for you. And so if we'll bow your heads and close your eyes, I just had a couple questions. First of all, I wanted to ask, how are you doing? How am I doing? at taking care of the hurting and broken. Do we, do we look like a hospital or do we look like a country club? The minute that we start to look perfect, clean and polished is the minute that we forget to have compassion for those that are hurting. And so how are you doing in that area? The next question is I wanna ask, when's the last time you really celebrated when somebody came home? All three of those parables that Jesus told all ended in a party. And we need to celebrate people that come to know Jesus. And we're gonna do that. That's, that's our goal as a church is we are going to celebrate those that find Jesus. So I wanna pray for, for those people that, that need to find Jesus right now. Cause I believe there's some people in the room that you haven't come to church before because you've been hurt not by the church, but by people who happen to go to church. And I wanna tell you on behalf of all, all followers of Jesus, I'm sorry that you went through that. I am sorry that that happened to you, that they said that. And instead, I want you to know the truth of who God says that you are. You are a son who is welcomed back into the family as if you never left. And so if that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed, just in a moment of privacy and concentration, I wanna give you an opportunity to make that decision to follow Jesus. And that, if that's you, for the very first time, you would say, Chris, I, I want to be joined into a family that watches my back like that. If that's you, I'm gonna ask you to look up at me. We'll make eye contact. You can raise your hand um, because I wanna pray for you and I just wanna know who I'm praying with. So if that's you and you would say, I need Jesus in my life, 
right now, will you look up at me? If I don't see you, just wave your hand at me. Awesome. Once you raise it, you can put it right back down. Awesome. Anybody else? You would say, I need Jesus. I wanna be a part of that family. Awesome. We're gonna pray and there's gonna be nothing super special or, or anything about these words. It's just a cry out of our heart, letting God, we know who he is and we want him to be a part of our life. We want him to be our focus. And we're gonna pray this prayer and I'm gonna ask that you repeat after me and everybody else repeat after me in an in a attitude of encouragement and celebration. Jesus, I need you. I acknowledge that I'm hurting and I'm broken without you. Come into my life, bring healing, bring hope, bring restoration as I follow you. I need you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Cowboy Junction, would you celebrate? Someone made the decision right now to follow Jesus and all heaven is rejoicing and partying, just like all those parables. And they're celebrating the decision that somebody made. Would you give it up for the person that decided to follow Jesus? Yeah. Woo! That's so awesome. I love in that scripture when it talks about the older son heard music and dancing. Because I grew up in church, right? And there was some pretty like traditional belief systems. And uh, <laughs> when I went to college, I actually went to a Christian university and they told us that you can dance, but if you dance, you can't move your hips. Which is really difficult because then you're like, <laughs> like you have to like be real careful. And like, we'd always joke around like, oh, don't move your hips. <laughs> But there is this, this sense of unabandoned celebration that goes, we are so excited for the decision that you made, that you are following Jesus because we remember what it was like to make that decision. And so I'm gonna invite our, our prayer partners to come up. If, if you're here and, and you would like to, to pray with somebody and you would say, I need prayer in this area of my life, I need some sheep to get my back. I need somebody to watch my back to agree with me. Then we've got prayer partners, people that would love to pray for you, pray with you on the sides. And so after service, after we dismiss, if you'd like to find them and uh, they just wanna talk to you and pray with you, they like get this excitement about it, that they just want to see uh, hope and joy restored in your life in, in whatever way that may be in your life. And so if you need that, make sure you come up to them. And then also, if you made the decision to follow Jesus for the very first time, or if you would say, Chris, I, I should have raised my hand. I should have looked up at you, but I didn't. Um, I'd love to meet with you over here at the Next Steps table. Uh, Steve and I are going to be over there because we've got some tools that we want to give you. Uh, the journey can be difficult. You can be kind of confused on what you're supposed to do, what's next. Um, so we have some tools that we wanted to give you so that you know um, just kind of what this journey is all about. And so if that's you and you'd like to meet us, we're going to be over there. Um, but don't forget to come back next week because we're going to have another, uh, it's, it's going to be awesome. We're talking about who God is and the questions that we have about God. And so if that's you and you're like, I want to come back and learn the why questions about God, then come back next week because Pastor Ty is going to bring an incredible message and talk about the questions that we may have about our God. So Cowboy Junction, it's time for us to love God, love people and have no limits. I love you. Jesus loves you. Pastor Ty and Heather love you. Don't you ever forget it. God bless you guys and have a great week in the Lord. See you later.